thank you very much, uh, Shell. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you for the nice advertisement about the uh, Sjöfartsmuseet Aquariet or Maritime Museum and Aquarium. It's the same thing. Uh, that's where I work, and today I'm going to talk about the Maritime Museum and Aquarium or Sjöfartsmuseet. And I will also give a few examples of how we are working with um, research in public aquariums. So I am from the public aquarium business or, or area. We are a maritime museum and an aquarium, so we are both focusing on man and sea, more like cultural history, marine cultural history, maritime uh, history, and of course, uh, we are also a public aquarium, so we combine uh, humanities and natural sciences in one building. It's a challenge sometimes, but the result is very nice because we can look at many different things in many different angles, so we can speak about environmental issues in a very broad sense and combining human and animals or the natural world. Uh, the aquarium is quite old, it's built in 1933, it has always, always host a, a cold water department but this one is uh, remade in the 80s so it's still old. We are fighting each day to get the pumps and the filters to work but uh, we have a lot of fish. Uh, these pictures show some of the fish we have. Um, but I choose to show only fish because we are at fish base, but we are focusing on all the marine life. So it's a misguided to just show pictures of fish, but you are fish people, so I will show them. The tropical department is uh, made up of uh, freestanding uh, smaller uh, tanks, and we focus a lot on tropical corals and, and the fish and other animals that live on the coral reefs. Uh, so this is just a few examples as well. Uh, we are focusing a lot of our energy in, in talking about marine environmental issues and also marine sciences. So we try to uh, build and make as much as possible that combine the aquarium with all the activities that we do to, for our visitors with research. And sometimes we even put up real scientific experiments in the exhibition for the visitors to help us to measure and uh, take part of the experiments. It's also a very big challenge because it's difficult to get it to work, but when you do it, it's very nice because then you can really talk about science and scientific method and also why we do research on animals and marine things. Uh, we also bring in uh, the real ocean. Uh, we have web cameras out in the sea, in the Gulma Fjord, and they are sending and broadcasting live directly into the aquarium so we can show our visitors both models of the real world in our aquariums, where we have models, of course, but they are only models of the, of the uh, real world. And then we also bring in, via screens, uh, the marine environment in real time. Sometimes you can see some fish in front of the camera. Uh, sometimes we build small nests for the fish to nest in. And sometimes we uh, put a dead whale in front of the camera to study what happens when a dead whale decomposes in the sea. And then we are talking about it our visitors. And this is what happens if you put a dead harbor purpose in, in the sea for uh, three months and then you make a time lapse from these underwater video cameras and you can see the decomposition uh, taking place. And uh, since the lights on continuously, during the night all these fish attracts from the light. So they uh, come each night but they're not eating from the from the dead whale, they are just there because of the light, I think. And it, you can see that it takes some time for uh, the purpose to dis, uh, disappear. And another problem with cameras in the water is that you need to go down and dive and, and clean them because there are settling some animals and algae on the screen. Uh, after a month, uh, after three months, the, the dead whale disappears. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I just showed you what we do. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about um, natural populations and the decline of natural populations. Um, this report just came out and I think your colleagues took part in it uh, from VVF and also from the Sociological Society in London and just coping and modifying slightly uh, one of the uh, tables from, from the website of VVF. Uh, this is really sad numbers. So since the 1970s, marine life has disappeared 
to a very large extent. And uh, I was born 1970, so all this is taking place and happens since I was born during my lifetime. And I, like the old other speakers today, they said they like or love biodiversity, they love the marine life or aquatic life, that's the same for me. So this is really, really saddening for me to see this and also maybe be part of it. And as a representative from, from the public aquarium side, I think it would be really, really sad if, if we in some way are active in this. The only way that we can work, I think, is the opposite. Uh, what we do should um, work against this, so everything we do should actually reverse these numbers, make the marine life go up again, if that's possible, but that's my take on the whole thing. Uh, of course, Nemo has been said, named by almost all the speakers today, and uh, I don't know if it's completely right, but there was this uh, uh, investigations that a lot of natural populations of clownfishes, they disappeared or reduced uh, severely numbers after the movie, uh, Finding Nemo, because of uh, the huge demand for clownfishes. And then, as uh, Svein said, there has been a lot of success in breeding uh, clownfish. So nowadays, hopefully, uh, we don't need to catch them in the wild. And uh, if you are successful with an animal in uh, breeding or culturing, uh, then of course it's a good thing to do in the public aquarium business. You breed them and you share them among your colleagues. So this is a male clownfish guarding or taking care of the eggs. And some people are afraid of what will happen when, when Finding Nemo 2 comes out uh, later this year. Will there be a new surge for animals from uh, the ocean or uh, will we not face that problem? So, conservation project at Sjöfors Museet Aquariet. We do it in many different ways. Of course, a very important thing is to give our visitors, the public, information. We educate them. There are lots of school children coming to our place each day. And we try to make the visitors engaged in being part in saving the ocean life, for the marine life. But also, we do captive breeding and we do research. And the last two ones are the things that I'm going to talk more about. So captive breeding, the other speakers has also mentioned this, uh, but my idea is that if, if one aquarium becomes good at breeding one of the species they have, uh, then they can share with other aquariums. And that's how we do it in, in the public aquarium business. If you are good at breeding seahorses, for instance, this is a male seahorse giving birth at our aquarium. And that looks really funny. And uh, there are a lot of small seahorses coming out. And of course, there is only a few percentages of, of those that survive uh, but then, if you are successful, you can share the seahorses. Or this one, the sepia bandensis, a small cuttlefish, the pygmy, pygmy cuttlefish. Uh, it's very nice. It's not a fish, but it's a cuttlefish. So I, I think it's allowed to be here. And <laughs> we uh, have been successful in breeding this one. Uh, they lay eggs, and they hatch, and we have a lot of eggs. And these are actually small cuttlefishes. And yesterday, I brought a few of them, to the colleagues at Aquaria, the water museum here in Stockholm, and you can see how happy they were. <laughs> so this is also uh, a reward uh, if you're successful in breeding species. We do research. Uh, we have, unlike most uh, public aquariums, we are, have been able to build our own research area or research department. It's a small place, but we, can have, we have our own DNA lab, we have a experimental lab, and of course we can do lots of experiments on, for instance, corals out in the culturing uh, department. Uh, the title from the, uh, from the uh, talk was a distributed repository of endangered marine species. That's one idea how we think that we are going to work. Uh, so, for instance, Sjöfors Museet Aquariet, we connect with both private aquarists and other public aquariums, and the, those other public aquariums might also have their network of private aquariums or private 
aquarists, hobby aquarists, and together we can build this living gene bank of, of living animals that we otherwise would not be able to house in our small aquarium or our uh, locals, uh, localities. We need to make this bigger and we need to make it work together with private people and other public aquariums. So one way of doing this is that we connect with um, hobby aquarists that are um, especially interested in, in corals. They are coral nerds, if you want to, and we arrange these um, um, coral meetings at the Sjöfartsmuseet. So each year, twice, uh, time, two times each year, they come to us and they, we arrange um, lectures and, and afterwards they change their corals, barter them. And uh, for instance, uh, Shell has been there talking, if you recognize him in the picture, uh, talking about um, also the, animal, uh, the aquarium trade. Yeah. Very nice talk. But this way we, we connect with them and we be, are able to uh, learn them and also learn from them. That's very important for us. Uh, so we also recognize, like some of the, of the speakers, that uh, hobby aquarists are really good at, at breeding or culturing animals. And for instance, coral aquarists, they are really good at this. And most of them, or many of them, are even better than we are. So we need to get their knowledge. We need to sample or collect their knowledge and maybe publish it scientifically later on. Otherwise, it, the risk is that it stays with the different or individual aquarists. So I'm going to talk about three different uh, uh, bachelor theses that been, has been made at the research department at the Sjöfartsmuseet Aquariet. Uh, two of them are already finished uh, and, and one is uh, ongoing. Um, so one is in small spotted cat shark, another one is in a coral called Ceratophora hysterix or bird's nest coral. And there's an ocean acidification experiment or uh, project running with uh, different corals. So the first one, uh, and this is actually a fish, so this is really perfect for, for this symposium. Um, Rickard uh, made his uh, bachelor thesis uh, this spring and he called it conservation genetics of small spotted cat sharks. Uh, this study was done together with Havitsus and some of our colleagues from Havitsus are here today. Uh, and this was partly funded by uh, VVF. So uh, Rickard, he uh, sampled uh, small spotted cat sharks and they live in most of, of Europe's coastal waters, both in the Mediterranean and, and the Atlantic and North Sea. Um, there's been some population genetic studies uh, identifying uh, one population in the Mediterranean and one in the Atlantic or uh, North Sea. And uh, in Swedish waters, it has been declining. So Harvard Zeus has started this uh, conservation project where they breed. They're very successful in breeding this sh shark and they release uh, cat, sh uh, cat sharks to uh, uh, every each year. Uh, but as with most uh, conservation projects, there is also always a risk that you have too few individuals in your breeding project. So you need to bring in more or fresh blood or fresh genes or whatever you call it. And there are some French sharks uh, in Sweden. They were important to Sweden for another research project. And the question was, can we use these French sharks in the uh, breeding program uh, safely or are they too genetically diverse? Um, so Rickard, went to Sjöfartsmuseet uh, Aquariet. He went to Universum, another aquarium in Gothenburg. And of course, the Havitsus, because in, at Havitsus, that's where they breed them. And together with a veterinarian, we took DNA samples uh, from uh, both Swedish sharks in all three places and also those French sharks at the Universum. And Rickard used the mitochondrial DNA uh, to uh, investigate the relationships with the sharks. And this is from his slide, um, just showing that previous studies uh, with published data um, have identified one population of sharks in the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, they are quite uh, different from the other sharks. There's one North Sea Atlantic population, but also most sharks 
or many sharks at least, have a genotype or haplotype that you can be found in all of the uh, area of where the shark, sharks are found. Uh, and the Swedish ones uh, belong to the big, big group of sharks that you can find anywhere. And we also did this uh, other DNA test uh, with nuclear DNA, something called microsatellite uh, low size, and, and you can measure how different populations are and, and the result, even if it doesn't say it's very much a non geneticist it's very uh, small, so it points to that the sharks from Swedish and French water are not different, and also there was a very high p-value. So the conclusions from uh, Rickard's study was that uh, the, the micron markers show that Swedish and French sharks are, uh, have greater similarity with sharks from the Western Mediterranean and Sea and in the Atlantic. Uh, the microsatellite data indicates that the populations uh, are part of the same population, and probably, but we will gather more data, we can use those French sharks at the breeding project at, at Harvard Zeus, and it would really be good because you need more blood or more new genes. But he also safely ended with saying more data is needed, so that's also a good way to finish. The other uh, study we did at the uh, Hjöfarsmyset Aquarius was on corals. Now I'm leaving fish, the fish world, but uh, corals are very important for fish. So, so Linnea Servin, she made her thesis at uh, this species, uh, Ceratopora hysterix, bird's nest coral, very common coral. So this is not a threatened or uh, endangered species uh, on the opposite, but it serves as a model species. So we use it to do manipulative experiments and ocean specification experiments and things. So she used it. And why she chose that one was in this network of hobby aquarists that we have built up, uh, we uh, send out uh, an email or and also made an advertisement on their web page and ask, ask them to uh, give us samples from their corals. So all the hobby aquarists that have this bird's nest coral in their tanks, some of them at least, they agreed to send in samples uh, from their corals. They took photos, they described how they are behaving, and they um, send in. So we have corals from all over Sweden, or at least all over southern Sweden. 20 samples were sent to us from, from different breeders uh, or coral aquarists, and uh, also 10 from and samples from uh, public aquariums. And then Linnea did uh, DNA analysis and she used uh, also mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA to <coughs> investigate how closely related they are to corals in the, in the wild and also how different they are from each other, uh, the corals in Swedish aquariums. And she found that um, the corals in Swedish aquariums she compared them to a published study uh, by uh, Bongaerts et al. from uh, the Great Barrier Reef, and they found three distinct different lineages, or even closely to, to call them different species, from this uh, bird's nest coral. And there is, there is no genetic uh, exchange between this back reef uh, genotype, the upper slope genotype, and the deep slope genotype. And lineas, or our corals, they group together with this upper slope genotype. So all of these samples that we uh, got from Swedish aquarists were the same genotype as the upper slope one. And you can maybe discuss why is that one more suitable for keeping in aquariums? Uh, or is it more easy to collect in the wild? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, but you can discuss it. She also did a genetic diversity uh, analysis with the microsatellites, so you, she can measure how many different alleles or genetic variants she can found. And one thing with corals is that they are clonal organisms. So one coral clone is, uh, consists of several thousands individuals, but all the individual coral polyps are, are genetically identical because they are all coming from one coral larvae that settles and starts this clone. So if you fragment a coral clone, as most 
hobby aquarists that breed uh, corals do. We don't reproduce them or we don't do make them uh, reproduce sexually. We make them reproduce clonally, just like uh, with, you do with many plants. So if you share one coral clone, then of course you will have two new clones and they will be the same genetic individual, but they will be different and you can share them among aquariums. So the risk of building a gene bank in Swedish aquariums is that there is only one genetically identical individual in all the aquariums. And that's not a very good gene bank because you want high genetic diversity as well. And so Linnea also asks herself how many different clones or genetic individuals do we have in the samples in Swedish aquariums. And uh, actually, quite surprising, from 30 samples uh, from both public aquariums and private aquariums, she could only find uh, three clone pairs. Um, I would have suspected that many, many more of them would belong to the same clone, being shared among uh, hobby aquarists, but that's not the case. And we used 10 microsatellite uh, markers, that's the same number of DNA markers that you use if, if you want to make a criminal case investigation in humans and things. So we, are very, we have a very high statistically uh, feeling for that this is the right th uh, answer. Um, so high genetic diversity in Swedish aquariums of this otherwise tropical coral. Uh, and the third and last thing I'm going to show you is an ongoing uh, thesis being done by David, who works at the aquarium, and this is just my quick uh, working title. But we are investigating how ocean acidification are affecting corals. Uh, that's not a new thing, of course. Many people have been investigating how corals uh, are affected by lowered <coughs> pH value in the sea, but with different species and also different genetic individuals, you need to be able to test how does a specific uh, genotype or a specific um, species uh, tolerate ocean acidification? So by building up this, sorry for this, uh, experimental lab, we can change the pH value in, in tanks. So you can go from 7.4, 7.5 up to maybe 8.4. And the natural pH value in, in the ocean is 8.2 or 8.1 now. And then we, take these small, small fragments. We can take in individuals from just one clone and then put them in the tanks and start experiments and let it run for maybe three months or something. And then we measure. And by doing the uh, setup with the aquarium computers, we can really control the level of uh, the pH. And you see that we are reducing the pH extra during the night and then raising it slightly during the day, so we try to mimic this diurnal variation that occurs in the wild. And just quickly, the results from three quick tests. We haven't done any statistic yet because we are doing this study still, but uh, for three different species of corals, you can see that there is some effect at least. The higher the pH value, the better the growth, at least for the two species here. Something strange is happening, but we have seen this is in many different experiments. So Seattle hystrix, this bird's nest coral, actually seems to thrive at this pH level. And when you raise the pH above the natural pH level, then it goes down again. But we need to do more experiments to investigate that. All right, so that was just... Um, Quick thing uh, about the, the research that we do at uh, the Maritime Museum and Aquarium. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Björn. Is there anyone who has any questions? Yes. Wait. I would like to know a little about your expansion. Yeah, uh, thank you for asking. Uh, 
So um, you've heard about it, and, and we are going to expand and, and build a new, com completely new aquarium building outside the old building, and, and it's working fine. And the politicians, they have um, gave us the money, told us that we have the money, and the process is running. So everything looks very good, and um, maybe within a year or one and a half year, we can start working or building the new aquarium, and then also close the whole museum and totally remake the museum. So in, in uh, good time to the celebration of, of the city of Gothenburg, celebrating 400 years, 2021, we will have a new aquarium and a new museum. Yep, so that's nice. Any other questions? For Svenska eller engelska? Då tar jag jobbet ifrån Kjell. Då så. Ingen som har några frågor? Nej, då får vi tacka Björn. Tack så mycket. Och lite presenten. Tackar.